this awareness is what we are. We are aware, we are conscious, right? Feel free to open your eyes at any point. Feel free to leave them closed if you like. Feel free to stay in that awareness of breath even as I speak. <clears throat> so my name's Karalia, as Angie said, and oh my goodness, the stories I could tell. Um, when I was in my 20s, I was overseas in Canada. I had literally run away from home. I mean, not literally, but I had. I'd run away from home. I'd run away from New Zealand. I'd run away to the other side of the world where I wasn't around anybody that knew me and I felt free to be me. And I discovered drugs and alcohol. And it was like a whole new world. It was like completely different. It was like I'd been in this box before and suddenly, yeah, I felt free. It was extraordinary. It was amazing. And I was working as a waitress. I was making really good money, like $1,500 a week. This is like 20 years ago. Uh, I was freelancing as a journalist. I had written my first screenplay, which went on to win a national award in Canada. I was go-go dancing at nightclubs and at big events, big ski and snowboarding events, because I was living in Whistler. And I met this really amazing man who was so sexy, intelligent, funny, extraordinary, and he fell madly in love with me within about two weeks, was just like, oh my God, are you kidding? And it was incredible. <clears throat> and you can imagine this is not going somewhere good. Um, <laughs> the thing about falling in love with someone amazing was that I started to get really, really scared and insecure and started to freak out. And he'd fallen in love with me when I was like on a high and feeling good and rocking it and dancing and all of those things. And then when I became scared and insecure, I turned into this person that he didn't know who I was. He's like, you, you look different and your voice changes and I don't know who you are. And so I started to have this really weird experience with this man where he, he was literally falling out of love with me and I knew it and it felt like on my side of things that he'd fallen in love with my exterior and once he got to know who I really was, he didn't love me anymore. And that was the most painful, scary, scary thing ever for me. And I was desperately trying to hold my shit together at the same time and I was also doing heaps of yoga and meditation. I started doing a whole lot of yoga, a whole lot of meditation, and I was beginning to find myself. At the same time as also, I was coming off a seven year bender, pretty much. I'd gone to London and done a whole lot of ecstasy, and then when I got to Whistler, all the drugs were basically free, pretty much. I mean, it was like 10 bucks for an ecstasy tablet, it was 35 bucks for a gram of Coke, and everyone was doing everything, and I was partying six, seven nights a week, whilst working full time, whilst <laughs> freelancing as a journalist, whilst go-go dancing. Um, anyway, my fiancé, because he became my fiancé, he was the MC for a 10-day festival at Whistler and the um, Black Eyed Peas were playing. And I, so I was backstage and he literally called me out on stage and announced to the crowd of 10,000 that we were getting married. It was pretty full on time. Anyway, we go to this festival and at the festival things were just, the wheels were falling off completely. And we took ecstasy on the Friday night, and then we took mushrooms on the Saturday. And not a lot, you know, like one pill, half a gram of mushrooms. Like, it wasn't like I was taking a lot of drugs, right? I can see people in the back laughing, going, it's not a lot. Um, and then on the Sunday morning, we had like half a tab of acid. And that was the moment. I went to yoga on half a tab of acid at the same time that I'd had this premonition, my best friend was with us at the festival, and I had this premonition that my fiance and my best friend were gonna be in a relationship together. And I was trying to process this. I go to the yoga class on acid and go into lion's pose, which is this one where you, I might as well just do lion's pose. You know lion's pose? You're on your hands and knees and your tongue sticks out, it's like. So there I am doing lion's pose in the yoga class and something in me just went boom and I went into this massive awakening and all of a sudden I had no sense of identity and I was everything and everything was me and I knew everything and I just got up and I left the yoga class and I started to wander around the festival 
not talking to my fiance because he was really upset with me, so he wasn't talking to me, which was painful as well, just literally starting to lose my mind because I was having this dual experience of absolute awakening and absolute terror because this relationship was imploding and there was nothing I could do about it. So about five days later, I, we, my fiancé and I, we drive home. He's still not really talking to me. I am desperately trying to get a grip because I'm having all of the... I'm, like, literally in the shower, and I can feel my fiancé inside me. Like, he's talking through me, and I can feel on the other side, when I turn around the other way, God is talking through me. So I'm, like, turning this way, and there's God, and turning that way, and there's my fiancé. I'm, like, going, what is happening to me? Because I knew it wasn't quite normal, but I couldn't figure it out and I couldn't talk to him about it either. So by Thursday, so we're talking five days after, um, <laughs> he's beginning to realise that something's not right with me. So he gets my friends over and by this time I'm not really communicating with them and I'm sitting in this chair and I'm having all of these flashbacks to past lives and I start speaking in ancient Egyptian and he's just like, all right, I'm out of here. We've got to take it to the psych ward. So they bundle me in the car, and we're in Whistler, and they drive me all the way down to Vancouver. And I'm in the back seat, and I know I'm being taken to the psych ward, but I still can't communicate, because if I was to open my mouth and communicate with this man that I love so deeply, I would have just gone into total grief and vulnerability. And because of my unresolved childhood trauma that I was not yet completely aware of, that I, I just couldn't do it at all. So I couldn't talk to him. So we get to the psych ward, and I remember the psychiatrist is checking me out. I'm on my hands and knees doing prostrations to the sun god Ra in all four directions. <laughs> and my fiancé and the psychiatrist are having a conversation about me, you know. And the psychiatrist, bless him, he called it spiritual burglary. He's like, I think she opened a few doors she wasn't ready for yet. <laughs> So they give me some sedatives and um, I wake up in the psych ward the next day and the, you know, channeling the ancient Egyptian goddess is gone and the Sun Ra god, prostrations are gone, but I'm in a psych ward. And that was kind of the beginning of the reckoning for me. Um, to cut a long story short, they, they only kept me for like three days, they gave me medication, they sent me on my way, they're like, yeah, you're bipolar, you know, you'll be fine, just take this medication. I go back home, fiance's still not talking to me, and he breaks up with me within about three weeks, because now, not only does he have this insecure woman, but now he's got a woman who's actually crazy, and he, there's just too much for him to handle. So he breaks up with me, and he moves, he leaves the house that we're living in together. So I'm in the house by myself, pretty much four weeks after coming out of the psych ward, and I start going into another psychosis, where I start to have these fantasies that he is arranging this secret mountaintop wedding, and he's going to bring the helicopter down to pick me up and take me up to the top of the helicopter so we can get married. Which, of course, was my psyche's way of trying to avoid the immense grief that I was feeling, because not only had I just been told that I was bipolar, I'd come out of a psych ward, my fiance had broken up with me, he'd moved out of the house, I didn't have a job, I couldn't afford the house, I had no family in town, I couldn't be vulnerable, I couldn't talk to any friends, so my mind was trying to come up with something that would feel good. It would feel good if we were secretly going to get married on top of the mountain. No. So... <laughs> Five days later, the cops picked me up because I'd leapt half naked onto the back of a logging truck thinking I was playing Fear Factor, trying to rip off the tags as I was running along the top of the logs on the truck that was still moving. I am back up in the psych ward again. <laughs> Um, same thing, they sedate me and I wake up. And this time I wake up, and I remember I woke up in, the, in, in a psych ward, there's four beds to a ward. I was in the bed closest to the door, and I wake up with this immense grief because I'm not high and in the psychosis anymore, and I wake up with the reality that I am no longer in that relationship. I've just been dumped by my fiancé. But I can't reveal emotion in front of people. So I still can't cry and reach out because for me to be vulnerable and reveal emotion was like the scariest thing in the world. So I'm in the psych ward and I'm like, okay, I've got this. I'll just go out on the lawn and I'll do some yoga. I'll do some ashtanga, which I do. And then I later read in my patient notes, which I got from the psych ward, patient is doing a vigorous manic form of yoga. And I'm like, it's ashtanga. 
You know, you're projecting. But my whole mission in the psych ward that second time, I'm like, I just have to prove that I'm sane so I can get out of here. Right? I had the presence of mind to recognize that if I started telling them that I'd had some kind of spiritual awakening and that I could heal people with my hands and that I could do X, Y, and Z and that I could perceive this and I knew that and this was going, they'll think I'm crazy. So I didn't say anything, I kept my mouth shut, I did the art therapy like they told me to. And then after nine days, they let me out. Um, and I had a little bit of validation, like on the third day, this woman sidles up to me, she too was a patient, she's like, what are you doing here? And I'm like, what do you mean? She's like, you seem saner than the doctors. <laughs> So obviously I was convincing the patients that I was sane. Uh, so I came home to New Zealand because I had no choice, which was where I'd run away from. And I just realised that I had to start basically facing into all of the unrealised and unresolved trauma that had sent me there. And what I learned from this experience is that yes, mental illness is real and that I had ways that my psyche was operating that it had uh, learned when I was a child in order to keep me safe. But as an adult, those same ways of operating were causing issues, right? And also, I had gone through this extraordinary awakening. So both of these things were true. Right? It was mental illness from the perspective that the way my mind was working was no longer beneficial for me. And it was an awakening in that I started to experience like what you might call multidimensional reality. So I went on this journey of healing using yoga and using meditation. I didn't end up engaging with mental health services, partly because of the kind of trauma that I was carrying. I didn't trust people at all. And because I was also incredibly perceptive. So if someone was judging me, or, or had any kind of like projection or anything like that, I just couldn't deal with it. I couldn't deal with holding what they were thinking about me and trying to deal with what they were thinking about me whilst I was trying to figure out how I was thinking about myself and trying to deal with my own internal judgment. I had no space to deal with their judgment. So I just, I was just like, yeah, nah, nah, I'm gonna sort this stuff out myself. And so I did. Um, I did a whole lot of yoga and meditation. I ended up teaching yoga, and then I ended up leading retreats and immersions and trainings and working very deeply on the mental, emotional level, supporting people to be able to flush out the conditioning that was causing the problems. Um, and I, you can read about this in my book, which, yeah, Sex, Drugs, and mostly yoga. It was mostly yoga. <laughs> Um, what else do I want to say? Just a couple more things. Okay, so one of the biggest things that I've realized, particularly in my journey of yoga, is that a lot of people when they go through mental illness, like for me when it happened, I felt like I was fucked up, that I was fundamentally flawed, that there was something so broken at the core of who I was. And that idea, that thought, made me feel so deeply ashamed and so deeply scared and so, so bad. But what I realized over time, I wasn't fucked up. I wasn't flawed. I was just dealing with the conditioning. The conditioning as a result of the circumstances that I had come through. And I started to get in touch with that part of me that is that infinite, eternal part, which is simply awareness or consciousness. And that part of us is never fucked up, is never flawed, is never broken. And I think one of the major issues that I see in the way that mental health works is that people carry so much shame. There is so much shame. And we live in a culture, and I'm talking the colonial culture here, just to be really clear, the colonial culture operates on shame. They, people are taught to shame their children. They're taught to sh shame on you. You know, they're taught to shame each other. It's a, it's a way of controlling humans. And it is so incredibly damaging. So in the work that I do, it's so simple. Like when I work with people, all I am doing really is I am just sitting there and I am loving that person. And I'm recognizing that if I feel a little bit of judgment or irritation or 
want to push them away, I recognize that that is my shit. That has got nothing to do with the person sitting in front of me. And so as a mentor or as a teacher, if I have that stuff come up with a student, I go away and I do my work around that so I can dissolve the part of me that I am seeing in that person so that I can then hold that person in front of me with unconditional love. And what I see time and time again, we don't need to have necessarily fancy techniques or tools or anything to heal. All we need is the capacity to be able to sit with people and to validate and acknowledge and love them and the experience that they are having right now. Right? And so often what happens is that we don't have the capacity or the ability to sit with another person's pain because we have not dealt with our own pain. And when we have not dealt with our own pain, we cannot hold space for another person. Right? And so I, what I see in this country right now is we have been traumatised collectively. The trauma of colonisation is huge. Still has not been acknowledged fully and it ripples out. And it's just not Māori who experience colonisation trauma. It is also Pākehā. I grew up Pākehā. I just had my ancestry done hoping there was some Māori in there. <laughs> nah. I'm so white. I'm white as white as they come. Um, but I grew up with this yearning for what I felt or sensed in Te Ao Māori because there was a sense of connection or holding or spirituality that I didn't get through this Presbyterian church necessarily, right, or through my culture. And so... <laughs> Just as a little aside, like the stop co-governance, I'm laughing, I'm going, come on, can we just let Te Ao Māori take over completely? You know, like Te Ao Pākehā's had it for the last 180 years, it's Te Ao Māori's turn, isn't that how partnership works? You take turns. Um, but one of the reasons for that is that sense of spirituality is so much more embedded there. It's embedded, and I feel that. So when it comes to healing as a culture, COVID, the immense trauma that we've experienced through COVID, through the mandates, through separation, through division, through trying to make other people believe what we believe because we feel safer when other people believe what we believe. But once you no longer need other people to believe what you believe and you can just be curious and you can go, wow, well, how do you see the world? What do you experience? And just be curious about it. So much begins to dissolve. You know, so my hope for us as a country is through gatherings like this, I thank you Jim for initiating this and for everyone that's come here to bring it, is that we can start to find ways to collectively heal trauma, which is the root of all mental illness and the root of all addiction, because we no longer have the time or the luxury to work one to one anymore. Right? We need to find ways, and there are ways, the old ways, and the new ways coming through, festivals, Right? to work together and to recognise that if we can work together and collectively, we can come a long way in a very short time. So that is my prayer, actually. You know, that is my prayer and what I wish to see is that as a whole country we open up to the wisdom of this land and the wisdom of this people and the wisdom of each other and we recognise that we are not our thought patterns, we're not our traumas, we're not our pain. And all of that can be healed and we can know that which we are which is awareness which is consciousness mm. blessings to you all may this be for a benefit for all people mm.